After a long winter, when you see colorful spring flowers, do you feel some type of renewed sense of energy, a budding anticipation for something special that is coming? I know I do, and you probably do too. Isn't it amazing how even though all of us people are all so different, there is something really special about spring that brings us all together in a shared experience. Spring flowers signal the return of sunnier and warmer days to come. They are splashes of color that signal the emergence of a new season. As we look to nature for wonder, joy, and inspiration, we also look for ways to relate and connect with nature. Today, we have a special story to share with you. It's a wondrous story, not unlike a complex tapestry, weaving together the miraculous mysteries of nature in combination with the persistent, creative, and driven ways of human ingenuity. It's a story about daffodils and the people who turn pollination into an art form to create and inspire new daffodils that you've probably never seen before. It's mid-April, year is 2020. COVID-19 is a pandemic that is forcing us all to stay healthy by keeping our physical distance from each other in order to keep ourselves safe. The entire filming and creation of this short film involved strict adherence to proper physical distancing. The setting for this story is the Pacific Northwest, where we are experiencing an exceptionally sunny April. It's a beautiful afternoon, and we have not seen any of our close friends in person for over 40 days. Seeing and spending time with our friends fills us with a renewed sense of happiness. We decide to meet up in their beautiful garden and keep healthy physical distance from each other. Our good friends Bill and Terry have the most beautiful gardens surrounding their home. Bill is a cultivator and creator of daffodils. On this day, we have the special opportunity to ask him about these remarkable spring flowers that inspire so much wonder, joy, thankfulness, and creativity. Have you ever had a special flower that every time you saw it, you went, oh, wow, that's a beautiful flower. Now, if you asked me about what my favorite flower was, I would be hard pressed to come up with a single flower that's my favorite because I think all flowers are so wondrous. When we sat down with Bill and asked him about his favorite flower, the daffodil, this is what he had to say. They're fun to grow, they're beautiful, and I like to give bouquets away and show people what daffodils can look like, because these are not your run-of-the-mill daffodils I'm looking at. So when you give someone a bouquet, how does that feel to give them a bouquet of your daffodils? I'll let you know after you leave, or before you leave. <laughs> <laughs> he gave us a bouquet of daffodils, and we love it, and it made him happy too. But it's kind of fun to see see oh, like, yeah. the, like the, the happiness that they bring. Well, we, the neighbor, he's got chickens, and he... No one's picking up eggs. So he offered us eggs and we brought him daffodils. And so it was a trade and it was like, nice. made us both happy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there are so many natural wonderments in this glorious world. And there are unique happenings that are unique to each season. We asked Bill why he thought daffodils were so special. And this is what he told us. They're the, they're the first major flower to bloom in spring. I mean, it means spring is here once they start blooming. We completely agree with his answer. 
We were curious, why did Bill choose daffodils as his flowers of choice to cultivate? Well, I guess when I was a kid, my mom bought bulbs and she, I helped her put them in the garden and a couple years later, there were like twice as many as we bought. So I thought, this is a pretty cool investment. You buy a bulb and it multiplies over years. And um, what I found is really not that great of a monetary investment. <laughs> But uh, it's fun to propagate these bulbs and try to make more. You might be wondering how long Bill has been a daffodil enthusiast. And how long was he planting daffodils before he started cultivating them and creating new daffodil varieties? You know, back in 1980 when we had our first house in Oklahoma, we bought daffodils. And when we moved to Louisiana, we dug them up and took them to Louisiana. And then we took them to Pennsylvania. Then we took them to Ohio. Then when we moved to the Virgin Islands, we took them to Missouri and just put them at her dad's house. So it was like a good garden thing to have. We liked them enough to move them around the country. He went on to share with us the difference between different daffodil varieties and why some are valued more than others. But then I, then I discovered show quality daffodils first types most people start growing, you, they're mostly grown over in uh, um, Holland by farmers that grow hundreds of acres of them. So they're, they're kind of a commodity bulb. There's millions and millions of them. These here in the garden, this batch right here, this is all there are in the whole world. So the breeder sold them all to me and this is all there is. These are like $40 bulbs. Wow. <laughs> but I mean, it's also supply and demand. There's, there are just very few. And if you have a highly prized show flower and all the show people want it, you may only have 10 or, sell, 10 or so to sell every year. And the prices will come down as they multiply, but if they're newly introduced, there's not that many of them. When we asked Bill how long he'd been cultivating daffodils, he went on to share with us some humorous beginnings that he would call failures. I'd say 2008 was the first year I tried to make seeds. And I planted the seeds and they didn't come up. So I just threw the dirt in the garden. <laughs> the next year they came up in the garden. So I had all these little babies coming up in the garden. So I realized they don't always, they don't always germinate in one year. So that was a failure because then I didn't know what bulb or what flower was from what parents. Or one might refer to this as experimental learning. Plus I was only using kind of run of the mill parents. So over the years I've uh, improved my, my breeding stock so I can make much better looking flowers. Does he still have any of those daffodils he moved from house to house? I think by the time we moved here, we figured it's time to start over. Maybe he doesn't have those original daffodil bulbs that he moved from house to house. Though because of the focused attention and fascination he cultivated through all of those years, he became the daffodil cultivator, enthusiast, and expert that he is today. While it takes lots of patience to be a daffodil cultivator, there is something really exciting about the process. Okay, so this one is called Ring Leader. It's a very, you know, it's a, it's a white, yellow, yellow, orange coloring. And the, the white part's called the parient. If it was a bit smoother, it'd be a better quality, quality flower. So what I have to do is go into my pollen bank and find a, a dad that has characteristics that I want to put onto this flower. So it's kind of like I'm playing God and I'm trying to make my kids look better. So. Bill gets to play matchmaker with his daffodils. Matchmaker, matchmaker, make me a match. Find me a find, catch me a catch. Maybe 
maybe it's got a weak stem and you want a stronger stem. I've got a couple, couple flowers that are known to be a strong stem. So it's like you look at the characteristics and try to figure out what do you want to improve. So sometimes it's the passion and excitement to create something spectacular that inspires great creativity and precision. There is great art in the daffodil cultivator's garden. Now that's exciting. Oh yeah. I mean, I get to decide what I want my kids to look like. They don't always look like, like you want them to. But I guess that's true in all, in all facets of life. You can hope for the best. But doing this, I'll do 500 crosses. Maybe 10 of them will turn out really, really spectacular. And I can show you some of my babies that just bloomed this year. Life is about millions of, of memorable moments. Some are grand and obvious, and others seem simple, yet amazing. We asked Bill what are some memorable moments in his daffodil cultivating journey. I mean, I like gardening and playing in the garden. But the first time we went to a national daffodil show, there's 300 daffodil nuts there. And you get to meet them and you get to know them and you have this common love for daffodils. I mean, you can make some really good friends in a short time period at those, at those events. So I think we've been to every national show ever since we went to the first one, except last year we did not go. The COVID-19 pandemic and the stay home, stay safe protocol has affected everyone. Normally, Bill has a daffodil cultivator friend from New Zealand who comes annually to see Bill. He brings his Southern Hemisphere daffodil bulbs to the Northern Hemisphere in hopes of creating new varieties. I have a friend from New Zealand. He's supposed to be here right now uh, to help plant bulbs and stuff, but he can't make it this year. He, he's come every year for the last three or four years, and he brings me bulbs, and he wants to plant his bulbs too, so I let him plant his bulbs here in the garden. Like, that bed right there are all his bulbs. So you're gonna to have to do his work for him this year? Well, but he didn't get to bring any new ones. He's gonna ship some. They should be showing up any day. But they're, again, they're from south of the equator, so they're, they still think it's fall. And so when I plant them, they bloom at the wrong time. Like I have, they'll bloom like July. So you cannot expect a spring bulb in the Southern hemisphere to come to the Northern hemisphere and bloom in the spring. The seasons are opposite. You must turn the bulb around and it takes them about two years to figure out they're in the northern hemisphere before they start blooming at the right time so that's called turning bulbs around so i've been turning his around those right in front of you are from john hunter from new zealand um you see they don't look so healthy because they were their foliage was up in january so <laughs> there's they they're still working big. they're still working on their turnaround exactly so yeah there's it's, there's a I met John Hunter a couple years ago when we were on vacation in New Zealand. But he's been breeding daffodils all his life. And the idea was um, to carry on his development of new daffodils and bring them north of the equator. So none of these, none of these flowers have probably been to the United States. So once I get them turned around, hopefully I can multiply them. There'll be a whole, almost a new breed by being up here in the Northern exactly. Hemisphere. Exactly. Huh, that's so cool. And so if he, if he sends you bulbs, um, you'll be able to at least carry on what he's trying to see happen here. Exactly. With, with his Southern bulbs. Exactly. And the reality is I didn't, the guy from California who's a daffodil nut, have money to buy these bulbs. But since he lives in California, they don't grow as well. So he sent them to me to grow them. Oh. Because they do much better up here. Because so it gets too hot too soon? It gets soon. too hot in the summer. So the 
deal I have with him is, well, once I get these bulbs turned around, I'll start sending him bulbs every spring and he can put them in shows. Plus, we get to save these daffodils that may just die out. And right. No one does it. Oh, that's, that's right. We wondered about the existence of original varieties of daffodils that had been planted by early settlers here in the Pacific Northwest. And if like the old apple varieties, these daffodils might still exist at old homesteads. I wonder like what old daffodil oh. varieties there might be that- Oh, they're, they're all over. Are, old homesteads have, we just picked some the other day off I-5 and, and Grandview. And the pioneers brought those over, you know, 150, maybe 200 years ago. They, they still exist in the States. Can these old daffodil varieties still be identified? Their yes. variety? Well, I say that. Those, those up there, mm -hmm. we found at some old homestead. And I put pictures on the internet to show them to, you know, the daffodil nuts. No one could really identify it. I found things very close, but it's not the exact. Which means they might be their own variety that had been brought here, pioneers and... Wow, that's really cool. All of us are unique and one-of-a-kind people with passions, fascinations, backgrounds, and dreams. While all of us people come from a variety of backgrounds and lifestyles, a focused passion around a single topic brings people together. For daffodil enthusiasts, the love and fascination for daffodils brings them together. Sometimes it's people's differences that make a diverse group of people really fun. Some people are like purists, go by the rules, very... Um, your daffodils got seven petals it gets disqualified so there's some of us that aren't so purists we might enter a seven petal daffodil just to see if they catch it have a little fun with it yeah <laughs> so there's the fun loving ones and there's the really technical, serious yes serious ones there are meetups and conventions for almost every topic any person can list it's truly a remarkable wonder the diversity of interests there are in the world. As you can imagine, there are daffodil shows and conventions that take place throughout the world. Enthusiasts coming together to share their wisdom, wonders, and friendship. What better topic to bring people together than the daffodil? What, what all do you do at a, at a meetup? Well, generally a show, majority of people bring flowers and they arrange them into a little test tube type thing. And then you compete um, against the other flowers. Now there's probably 300 categories. Cause like for instance, all two yellow oranges would be in a category. So you might have this guy and this guy competing against each other. And They're very they, different looking, yet, but yeah. But yeah. Right. Okay. But there's, and there may be six to ten flowers in that category, and they try to pick who is the, well, not who, but which is the best flower. And they give second, third, and special mentions, and you compete for ribbons. Or if you're, if you're more advanced, you don't just submit single flowers, you'll submit collections. So you could have a collection of 24 different flowers. And those are kind of the prestige. These are the people that grow the flowers seriously. So does the competition stay friendly? I would have to say, depends on the, <laughs> depends on the people. Uh, there are some showers that never lost. Bill went on to share with us stories of how competition is competitive, yet fun and supportive. Big winners always want to be winners, yet at the same time, they hope to see a new generation that will follow in their footsteps. While this is not a how to cultivate daffodils sort of video, it's incredible 
to have a glimpse into the natural wonder of daffodils and the wonderment of pollination. The white part is the carrion, the corona is the, the cup, and this one happens to be yellow, yellow, orange. You, you classify them by the, the shape of the daffodil. This one happens to be a two because this corona is more than a third the length of the perianth, but less than the length of the perianth. Isn't it absolutely incredible how many variations there are on all the different parts of a flower? For instance, it's a two, just by the, the ratio of the corona to the perianth. So this, if you talk to a daffodil person, you'd say this is a two white dash yellow, yellow, orange. So you've described the shape and the color by just calling it that. Like this one would be a, a one because the cup is so long, it's longer than the petal. So this is a one yellow orange. So if you're buying a daffodil with no picture, at least you kind of know what it should look like. You notice there's, there's six petals, and there's six pollen sacs, and one pistil, which is the female part. So how you pollinate them, you go, okay, I want something that We'll make this one better. So I go and look for one. So I pull some pollen with my tweezers and you dab it on. And that's really it. The trick is, it's going to make seeds this fall, and then you plant the seeds. Five years from now, it'll have a baby. It'll actually have a flower. Patience. So what you have to do is keep track of what did I just, what did I do? So I, I'm going to call this cross 240. So I've got an uh, Excel spreadsheet. This will be 20-240, the year and the, and the cross number. I'll take a photograph of this guy. Well, I've got, uh, you know, a photographic record too. It takes a lot of organization. If I can, and then I have to make a label, you know, a little stick label with, with a paint pen. And that will, follow, that will follow the seeds through until they get planted in the garden. It takes a lot of organization. And then we start making serious labels like this. Organization. If it if it's a viable flower in the future. Organization. So there's a lot of record keeping. And uh, organization is key because you've got, because basically if this makes a nice flower and I want to propagate it, I have to dig it up and not get it mixed up with all the rest of it. And patience. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm known for my patience. <laughs> <laughs> Pink Charm, Peggy McNeil, oh wow, Lime Bay, Rockin' Goose, Warm Welcome, Tidy Tippet, Surprise Package, Ricosa, Neon Light, Contralto, Cameo Gossip, Airtime, Camaraderie, Sunrise Fanfare. These are just some of the names of these beautiful daffodils. How do daffodil varieties get their names? Can anyone name them? Well, you give it a name that has not ever been taken. And somebody has to approve that name. Right. I don't, it's make, not that Make difficult. sure the name hasn't been taken. Right. And then but you can actually register a flower, even oh, yeah. if it's not some brand winner of anything yet. We can, call, we can register this and call it Megan or something. And that would be acceptable. <laughs> <laughs> we asked Bill if he's named any new daffodil varieties. And when he does, what will the special name of the new daffodil be? Oakley. 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 Name them after special people in your oh, life? Oh, yeah. <laughs> she's, she's my... Last year, this time, we came out here, and I told her she could start picking flowers. 
she was grabbing them by the handful and sticking them under her armpit and grabbing another hand. And every time she put them in her armpit, she'd drop one of them on the ground. <laughs> Does she have a favorite or just all of them? She just likes flowers. That's really cute. <laughs> yeah. Daffodils are such happy flowers. They're the true essence of spring. Daffodils inspire smiles. If you've ever doubted your ability to grow a flower, think again. Daffodils make people happy. Anybody can grow them. Anybody can grow a daffodil. Well, almost anybody. Well, if you live down the Caribbean, forget it. You gotta have some cold period. But most people can grow a daffodil. Bill took us for a walk through his daffodil beds. He introduced us to his daffodils, special daffodil varieties that are parents of his future new daffodils, and his daffodil babies. So here's a, here's a variety that I crossed back in 2010. And it, it bloomed last year, and it, but this is the sibling. But you can have siblings look totally different. <laughs> he pointed out different variations that happen even when daffodils are pollinated by the same parents. Variations always exist in life and in nature, and that is certainly part of the challenging and mysterious wonder of daffodil cultivation. Daffodils can be bred for color, size, proportions, smoothness, vigorous growth, stem strength, the list goes on. I was, I was trying to get some orange, orange flowers, which there's not that many orange, orange daffodils. It was like really deep orange. The shape is pretty so-so, but that's a pretty flower. It's really very amazing what can be created when you're excited and challenged to create something new. Sometimes new creations can be made quickly and with a sort of liberating artistic randomness. If, however, you want to create a new daffodil flower, you have to nurture your sense of excitement for your new flower creation while you exercise great, and I mean great, patience and organization. This is Lime Bay. And it, what's unique, it starts out yellow and it turns white. So it's a excuse me, one yellow, yellow, white, 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 yellow. <laughs> What is it that makes people spend great amounts of time cultivating daffodils, intentionally pollinating flowers in order to create new daffodil varieties and waiting years and years to see the fruit of all the work? The challenge of creating something new, even if it's years off in the future, is invigorating. The joy of anticipation certainly fuels the efforts and gives meaning to the whole endeavor. Once in a while, a single daffodil stem has two flowers. Some years, a normally six petal daffodil flower will have eight petals one year and then be back to six petals the next. This is Jamor. Last year, they all had eight petals, <laughs> which for a show, they don't like that. But this year, they're all six, so. Uncertainty gives life adventure. The mystery of variance gives us all hope that life's unpredictability is all part of life's daily wonders. Perhaps it's the uncertainties of life that inspire us to have hope in the miracles of life. We asked Bill, what are some daffodil names of varieties that stand out to him? We got one over there called American Possum, which I think is really pretty flower, but I don't think it's blooming yet. And guess what the name of this one is? What's your first impression? That's beautiful. Well, it orchid -ish? It's called, oh wow. Oh wow, <laughs> well, it was a wow. This one is a 11 white, yellow, pink, pink, called Drama Queen. There is great wonder in this daffodil. And because of this flower, so many wonders are inspired. For as real as this flower is, so too is the realness of wonder. Connect with Bill and his daffodils by visiting 
Carter's Daffodils on Facebook. See the link below. If you are new to watching Sea Tree Wonders short films, we invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. By subscribing to our channel, you help this video and other fun and inspiring Sea Tree Wonder videos get shared with more people. Give this video a thumbs up and share this video with your friends and family. Write a comment below and share with us what you love about daffodils, the spring, or flowers in general. Daffodils inspire smiles. Friends, we invite you to come along and enjoy more wonders with us by following Sea Tree Wonder on Facebook and Instagram. And keep in mind, you can become a Sea Tree Wonderist member by becoming a patron through Patreon. The support of our patrons means the world to us. Enjoy watching our always growing collection of video adventures as we appreciate natural wonders and simple everyday wonders. Thank you for watching. See you next time.